5. Abortion The Christian law with respect to the family appeared very quickly with respect to abortion. Plato had sanctioned abortion when conception took place past the age limits of the state-controlled procreation because it was an offence against religion and justice inasmuch as he is raising up a child for the state. As this statement clearly shows, religion and justice are set in the context of the state and its desires. Aristotle also required abortion when state-allowed births were exceeded. In Rome, Septimus Severus and Antoninus prohibited abortion not as intrinsically immoral or as murder, but on the ground that it defrauded the husband. For Plato and Aristotle, it was a matter of state law entirely. Rome saw abortion in the context of the father's right to an heir, so that the validity of abortion stood or fell in terms of that right. The condemnation of abortion as murder was quickly in evidence in Christian circles. In a collection of rules and comments, we read, Thou shalt not slay thy child by causing abortion, nor kill that which is begotten. For everything that is shaped and has received a soul from God, if it be slain, shall be avenged as being unjustly destroyed. Exodus 21-23, Septuagint. Tertullian declared, To hinder of birth is merely a speedier man-killing, nor does it matter whether you take away a life that is born or destroy one that is coming to the birth. That is a man which is going to be one. You have the fruit already in its seed. The church councils repeatedly dealt with abortion. Canon 21 of the Council of Ankara stated, Concerning women who commit fornication and destroy that which they have conceived, or who are employed in making drugs for abortion, a former decree excluded them until the hour of death, and to this some have assented. Nevertheless, being desirous to use somewhat greater lenity, we have ordained that they fulfil ten years of penance according to the prescribed degrees. It is not our purpose here to analyse the development of the penitential system or the changing ideas of it within the Church, but simply to note that the law of murder with respect to abortion was applied severely to converts who had been prostitutes and abortionists and barred them from full communion for ten years. Basil of Caesarea in Cappadocia, in his canons, held to the same requirements. Basil called abortion murder and declared also that a woman being delivered of a child in a journey and taking no care of it shall be reputed guilty of murder. In the Quinisext Council of 692, Canon 91 declared, Those who give drugs for procuring abortion and those who receive poisons to kill the fetus are subjected to the penalty of murder. Abortion was murder, suicide was murder, and self-mutilation was murder. Anyone who mutilated himself was subject to excommunication if a layman and deposition as well if a clergyman. For the Christians, the only open question here was administrative. God's law was final and absolute. A man's life was not his own, nor his body, nor the life of his unborn child. To tamper with these things was to sin against God. It meant attempting to play God with life, and all life and all creation was subject to man only under God's infallible word and law. The Roman conception of the priority of the states was hence anathema. It was a part of that sin from which men were to be saved, the attempt to be gods. The Roman position has since revived among sociologists, politicians and modernist clergymen. A sociologist has written, A demand for abortion is frequently viewed as a type of social deviance and indeed most responsible physicians insist it should be satisfied only as a last resort, yet social engineers should realise that at times abortion can be a vital instrument for social control, preventing serious family disorganisation, economic hardship and diminution of physical health. Recognition of this possibility by legislation 
may play an important role in fostering social and economic reform. The key clause in this statement is this. Social engineers should realize that at times abortion can be a vital instrument of social control. This precisely pinpoints the difference. Social control by man playing at God's is the goal on the one hand, and obedience to God's law is a requirement on the other. For this reason, the priority of God and his word, the Christian family, while sharply stronger than the non-Christian families in its environment, by no means resembled the conservative family of old Rome or of any other area. The loyalty was not to the family and to the authority of the father, but to God. This was clearly apparent in the first eyewitness accounts of Christian martyrdom, the death in the arena of a young woman, Perpetua, on March 7, 203, at Carthage. Perpetua was a young mother of 22, of a noble family, with an infant son at her breast and her breasts heavy with milk. We have her own account of the trial. Then my turn came, and my father appeared on the scene with my boy and drew me down from the step, praying to me. Pity thy child. Then Hilarion, the procurator, who at that time was administering the government in the place of the proconsul Minucius Dominianus, deceased, said, Spare thy father's grey hairs, spare thy infant boy, sacrifice for the safety of the emperor. And I replied, I do not sacrifice. Art thou a Christian? asked Hilarion, and I said, I am. And when my father persisted in endeavouring to make me recant, he was ordered down by Hilarion and beaten with a rod. And I felt it as keenly as though I had been struck myself, and I was sorry for his miserable old age. Much as she loved her father, husband and son, her God rather than her family came first in this situation,